This is the 16th example video on our series devoted to abstract algebra. And the main lecture video covered the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. And here we're going to extend that a little bit without proof to something called the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups and then look at some examples. So this theorem says that if G is a finitely generated abelian group, then G is isomorphic to Z cross Z cross Z, well, just a bunch of copies of Z, cross Z sub P1 R1, all the way up to Z P K R K. So if G is not infinite, then this part is not present, the part that is just Z cross Z cross Z, so on and so forth. And this part is called the free part. And that's because those are all of the portions that, well, essentially the elements do not have finite order. Whereas this over here, the Z, P1, R1, so on and so forth, this is called the torsion part. And I'd like to point out that in the video, there was no free part and it was just the torsion part, which means we would have a finite group. Notice if we have a free part at all, then it's an infinite group. Okay, so anyway. One more thing I'd like to point out is that these PI are not necessarily distinct primes. So our first example will be to classify all abelian groups up to isomorphism of order 450. And our strategy here will be to factor 450 into primes and then after that we'll just decompose that prime factorization into finite groups. And you'll see that there's kind of an algorithm to do this. Okay, so let's take 450. Notice that is 2 times 3 squared times, times 5 squared. So notice 3 squared is 9 times 5 is 45. And then 2 times 5 is 10. 45 times 10 is 450. So now our idea will be to write this in the form G1 cross G2 cross G3. And this G1 will encapsulate everything of this prime factor 2. So in other words, this will be order 2. This G2 will encapsulate everything with a prime factor of 3. So this will be order 2. 9, and then G3 will be order 25. That's everything of the prime factor 5. And then we've got possibilities for a couple of these. So the only possibility for G1 is Z2. And that's because there's only one group of order 2. But by our theorem, there are two groups of order 9, well, abelian groups of order 9. There's Z9, that's the cyclic one, and then Z3 cross Z3. Those are our two possibilities. And then likewise, for groups of order 25, you'll have Z25 and Z5 cross Z5. And now notice we've got a single choice here, two here, and two here, so there are four groups in total. And now we could enumerate them. There's Z2 cross Z9 cross Z25. There's Z2 cross Z3 cross Z3 cross Z25. There's Z2 cross Z, let's see, 9 cross Z5 cross Z5. And then finally Z3 cross Z3. Three, Z2 cross Z3, I should say, cross Z3 cross Z5 cross Z5. And those are all of our possibilities. And of course, we could apply an isomorphism theorem to smash these together if we wanted to. Since 2, 9, and 25 are relatively prime, we can push all of these together into the cyclic group Z450. Then, since 2 and 3 are relatively prime and 3 and 25 are relatively prime, we can push this into Z6 cross Z75. We could also push it into some other things as well. I'll let you think about what those might be. Then we could do something here as well. Maybe the best thing to do here would be to write this as Z2 cross Z5 cross Z5. 
45. So that's pushing this nine and this five together. And then you could write this a couple of different ways as well, but I'll let you do that. So all in all, there are four total groups. Let's do another one. Next up, we'll show that Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2, an infinite product of Z2s is not finitely generated. And I think this is like evidently true, but let's maybe hit it with a very large hammer just to practice some techniques. So let's by way of contradiction, suppose it is finitely generated. Okay, but note that everything has order two, which implies that Z2 cross Z2, an infinite product is in fact isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2, a finite product. Okay, because if something's finitely generated and everything has order two by our theorem over here, then everything has to come from a copy of Z2 cross Z2. Okay, but now let's write this maybe as Z2 upper N. So that would be N copies of Z2. And let's point out here that we have N copies of Z2. And then let's also introduce some notation where we call our original group G. Okay, but now let's notice we have this peculiar setup. We have G is isomorphic to Z2 upper N cross another infinitely many copies. That's because if you take off N copies, you still have infinitely many copies. So that's gonna be cross G like that. But now let's notice that the subgroup, which is the identity cross G, is definitely normal inside of Z2 to the N cross G. And it as a subgroup is isomorphic to G itself. So now what we'll do is take the corresponding quotient group on both sides. So let's do G mod G over here on the left. And then over there on the right, let's do Z2 upper N cross G mod this E cross G. Okay, nice. But now let's notice that the quotient group G mod G is isomorphic to the trivial group. So that's the group only containing the identity. Whereas this setup over here is isomorphic to Z2 upper N. That's by a fairly simple result that says something like this. If you take G cross H, and if you mod out with E cross H, you'll simply get G. Great, so you can check that maybe with the first isomorphism theorem if you want. But now let's take the order of both sides. So let's say this yellow arrow means we're gonna take the order. The order of the trivial group is one. The order of Z2 upper N is equal to two to the N, but this only occurs if N is equal to zero. But if N is equal to zero, that means that G was the trivial group to start with but I can find lots more than a single element inside of G. For instance, I've got the element one with a bunch of zeros, as well as the element which is just a bunch of zeros. Those are both inside of G. Those are two elements inside of G, meaning that there's more than one element inside of G, and that gives us a contradiction. Okay, so I think that's a bit overkill, but I think it's illustrative to look at all of these like little results along the way. So now let's prove or disprove the following statement. So if you've got groups G, H, and K, G cross H is isomorphic to G cross K implies H is isomorphic to K. And this is actually gonna depend on if you're in finitely generated abelian groups or not finitely generated abelian groups. And in this finitely generated abelian group setting, the answer is yes. And I think this is like kind of annoying to write down unless like you find a slick way to do it. But our strategy would be something like this. Notice we can say G is isomorphic to Z to the, maybe I'll say Z to the A, where that means A copies of Z. And then we'll have 
cross Z P1 R1 cross all the way up to Z P K R K. And then we'll have H is isomorphic to Z to the B. And then cross, maybe we'll have, let's see, we need another prime here. Let's say maybe Q1 to the S1 all the way up to QM or maybe QL to the SL. And then finally K will be isomorphic to Z to the C. And then cross, well, I need another prime. This is a little bit awkward, but maybe I'll take U1 to the V1, cross all the way up to Z, and then maybe UM to the VM. So something like that. And then from there, what we can see is that G cross H will be isomorphic to Z to the A plus B cross what I'll just say is more. And here, I'm doing a sketch of the proof. I'm not gonna work through all of the details. And then we'll have G cross K is isomorphic to Z to A plus C cross more. Okay, and that more is both torsion stuff. So in other words, everything over there has finite order. But then by this fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups, we know that these two must be isomorphic. So that tells us what? That Z to the A plus B is isomorphic to Z to the A plus C, but that immediately tells us that B is equal to C. And then likewise, we can show that all of these primes and all of these prime powers are also equal using the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. So putting that all together, we'll have B is equal to C, and then everything else is equal, so that means H is isomorphic to K. So like I said, this will not be true in the case that you have non-finitely generated abelian groups even. And we can look at that with our last example. So let's notice that Z2 cross Z2 cross an infinite product of Z2s is most definitely isomorphic to Z2 cross an infinite product of Z2s because Either way you slice that, you have an infinite product of Z2s, but it's pretty clear that Z2 cross Z2 is not isomorphic to Z2. This one has four elements and this one only has two. Okay, well, let's do another. So our next example is more like using some, so our next example is not directly from the theorems over here, but it's more like we're looking at techniques that were used inside of the proofs. So let's suppose we have a finite abelian group G, that's order P to the N where P is a prime, and then X is an element of G where the order of X is taken to be maximal. So it's the element with the largest possible order. And we'll set that order equal to M. And then our goal is to show that G to the M is the identity for all G in G. Okay, so let's see how to do this. So let's recall from Lagrange's theorem, we know that the order of G must divide the order of the group. So again, that's from Lagrange's theorem. But what kind of things divide prime powers? Well, it's smaller prime powers. So that means that the order of G is in fact equal to P to the K for k between 0 and n. And then notice that includes the order of x. So we know m is equal to the order of x, but that's going to be equal to p to the r, where this r is between 0 and n is maximal. So that's the important thing here, that that order is maximal. Okay, and so now let's get to it. So let's use this fact right here. So for some arbitrary G in G, we know from above that the order of G is equal to P to the K. Also, we know by the maximality here that K is less than or equal to R. 
Again, that's by the maximality of the order of x. And now we're essentially ready to just finish this calculation off. Notice that g to the m is now g to the p to the r based off of the form of m. But now that's going to be equal to g to the p to the k raised to the power p to the r minus k. And we know p to the r minus k is p to a non-negative number by this setup right here. Oh, but notice that g to the p to the k is g to the order of g, so that's the identity. So this is the identity to the p to the r minus k, but that's simply the identity. But that's exactly what we wanted. Okay, so that's just a few examples based off of this stuff, but I think that's enough like given the power of this theorem, and that's a good place to stop.